BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Wednesday, another Ripper Wednesday. Welcome to the show. Just a couple of quick announcements and reminders before we truly begin. The first is that there will be a Black Box Online Radio members only podcast that will be coming out this week, and it will be released tomorrow on Thursday. And if you're listening to this in the future, feel free to visit some of the links in the description box. One of them is for buymeacoffee.com. BuyMeACoffee.com slash BlackBoxNet88 allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show, and anybody who makes a donation will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. Now there is the launch of the Black Box Online Radio Premium Membership, which gives you access to bonus features and bonus content. And one of the um, features is the Members Only podcast, which is going to talk about a lot of the -the behind-the-scenes material, as well as just responding to questions, comments, and ideas from people who are in the membership. And as previously stated, the first one will come out tomorrow to anyone who's listening to these things as they come out live. Now, in this episode, I would like to talk about a Jack the Ripper suspect whom I've never covered before on the channel, and his name is Carl Feigenbaum. But first, to give us the most basic introduction, Jack the Ripper was a serial killer who operated in England in 1888. The crime spree that has been attributed to the Ripper began on August 31st and concluded on November 9th of that year. Whatever happened before or after that is, well, still a mystery, and the identity of the Ripper is still a mystery. Some people even think there were multiple killers. Other people think that it was a single killer, and then there are even some more um, more twisted theories that some of the confirmed crimes might actually not be confirmed. But I've never talked about Carl Feigenbaum on the channel before, and I would like to provide the most basic introduction. Carl Ferdinand Feigenbaum, also known as Anton Zahn, was a German merchant, seaman, and occasional florist, and alleged serial killer. And he was executed at Sing Sing Prison in America in 1896. His crime was murdering his landlord. And there's a hypothesis that accuses him of being Jack the Ripper. So, the first person to claim that Feigenbaum was Jack the Ripper was one of his two lawyers, William Sanford Lawton, who once his defendant had died, and Lawton was released from his vote of confidentiality. He he declared to the American press his certainty that Feigenbaum was Jack the Ripper. The two were the same person. In recent times, the suspicion on this German sailor rebounded thanks to an extensive investigation by former London Metropolitan Police. MIT, that stands for Murder Investigation Team, MIT Detective Trevor Marriott, which is condensed in the last three chapters of his book, Jack the Ripper, the 21st Century Investigation, which was originally published in 2005. This work reached an important circulation and has been the subject of several reprints. According to Marriott, the sailor could have landed in England thanks to being a crewman aboard the German merchant ship Ryher which arrived in British ports near Whitechapel in the fall of 1888, precisely when the Ripper murders took place. Now, I've read a couple things about this, and this seems a little bit um, difficult to follow, but I believe that when he says the fall of 1888, I mean, obviously, if the Ripper crimes began on August 31st of 1888, that would still be the summer. 
but I think he means is that the ship went out for a while, and then Carl Feigenbaum would have come back on September 30th. I believe the fall is referring to the September 30th docking of this ship, the Ryher. Specifically, he proposes that it could be crimes committed by the Ripper, and that Feigenbaum, given the mobility that his nautical activity allowed him, could be found in all of these places at the time of the killings. His list of Feigenbaum's possible victims, Marriott points to a crime that was committed in July in 1889 against a prostitute in Flensburg, Germany, where merchant ships arrived from the ports of Bremen and Hamburg, and suggesting the sailor could have traveled in them and subsequently been present on the date of the murder. It also includes the case that Laura Willsley, a.k.a. Lottie Morgan, was a prostitute who was killed with an axe in Wisconsin in the U.S. on April 11th of 1890, and then on September 4th, the same year, in Bern, Switzerland, he recounts the slaughter and subsequent mutilation of a young peasant woman. Wow, this story is just getting bigger and bigger. But the crime that he was actually committed for was the murder of Juliana Hoffman. And that's the culmination of this bloody trail was the violent death of Juliana Hoffman on August 31st in 1894. That's also a date in Ripper activity, as previously stated, where the perpetrator was no doubt Carl Feigenbaum. And I've gone through um, some of the usual websites, Jack the Ripper Tour, JackTheRipper.org, Casebook, as well as um, as well as BBC. And the story is that Carl Feigenbaum was witnessed directly by the son of Juliana Hoffman, who was a teenager at the time, 16 years old, and he saw Feigenbaum stabbing his mother. And it was a, actually a very vicious stabbing that sounds almost in line with what the Ripper would have done. I don't recall any of the terms like disemboweling or the removal of organs or pulling the intestines over the shoulder the way that the Ripper murdered his victims. But again, he was directly witnessed, and then he was sent to the electric chair in Sing Sing Prison, as you've already heard. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you guys. That info that I read came from Wikipedia. But the reason why I chose to read that one as opposed to something else was I thought that it was the most unbiased. If you were to go to some of the other Jack the Ripper websites, they um, are they kind of just jump right into the middle as opposed to giving the basic introduction of Carl Feigenbaum. Now, some points in favor of him being Jack the Ripper, a lot of people believe that Jack the Ripper was a foreigner, that he was not of English descent. Carl Feigenbaum was from Germany. Now, he was certainly a real person, but there were all types of conflicting stories about his birth and his activities, and you heard that possible victim list. I mean, we're talking about murders that happened all over the world, not only in England and America, but also in Switzerland, and I didn't even get to the big story about how a similar crime spree took place in Nicaragua, and that that um, killer was called the Managua Ripper, and some people think it's Carl Feigenbaum, but other people think that it was a different Jack the Ripper suspect named Francis Tumblety that went on to become the Managua Ripper, Managua being the capital of Nicaragua. But um, the reason why this image of Carl Feigenbaum looks a little bit different than some of the other um, images out there is because it was made by computers, and there was an article that came out in 2011 by Dr. Xantha Mallet, a forensic anthropologist that talks about the um, computer imagery used to create this uh, composite of Carl Feigenbaum. Jack the Ripper is the world, and I'm reading the article directly now, Jack the Ripper is the world's most famous cold case, the identity of the man who brutally murdered five women in London's East End in autumn of 1888 remains a mystery. More than 200 suspects have been named. But to Ripper expert Trevor Marriott, a former murder squad detective, German merchant Carl Feigenbaum was the top suspect. Convicted of murdering his landlady in Manhattan, Feigenbaum died in the electric chair in New York Sing Sing Prison in 1894. His lawyer suspected him of the Ripper murders, too. No photos of Carl Feigenbaum exist, so Marriott produced this new EFID for BBC One's National Treasure Live, created from the description of the admittance from when he was in prison and remained in New York. Why does Marriott think that Feigenbaum is Jack the Ripper? Evidence in the form of police documents and hundreds of letters give clues to the authorities of newspapers. The, assumptions has, the assumption has long been that Jack must have had anatomical knowledge because of the skill with which his victims' organs were removed, but it's possible that they were cut out in the mortuary rather than by the scene. 
The 1832 Anatomy Act made it illegal for medical personnel to remove organs for training purposes. This theory is supported by documents on the fourth victim, Catherine Eddowes. The inquest report shows only 14 minutes elapsed from the time the police did the last sweep of the square in which she was killed and her body being discovered. Was this really enough time for someone to have killed Eddowes, removed her uterus with surgical precision, and all in near complete blackness? Regardless of one's medical knowledge, this seems to be a stretch. So Marriott believes Jack wasn't necessarily a surgeon after all. He began to investigate other groups who might have been in the area. St. Catherine and the London Docks are a short walk from Whitechapel, a place a merchant seaman would have flocked to, as it was an infamous red-light district. Such close proximity would have made it easy for a killer to steal back to the ship unnoticed. The gaps between the murders also suggest that the killer might have been a traveler. This theory fits with other facts, too. Some suggest that the killer was a resident of Whitechapel, and wouldn't locals have given him up to the police, especially after a reward was offered. After some digging, Marriott came across records which showed the Norddeutsche Line, a German merchant vessel group that had a ship called the Reicher that docked at the time of the murders. When Marriott investigated the seamen aboard the ship, he came across the name of convicted murderer Carl Feigenbaum. Having watched his client die in the electric chair, William Lawton, yes, it's Lawton, L-A-W-T-O-N, told the press that he believed him to be responsible for the Ripper murders in London. Feigenbaum had confessed, he said, to suffering a disease from which periodically drove him to murder and mutilate women. What was this disease which made him undertake the brutal acts? Today, a psychiatrist is likely to describe it as a psychotic episode. Fortunately, few people with psychotic tendencies go on to become serial killers, but those who do gain an infamy matched by no other crime. At the time, everyone believed all five women had been killed by the same man. But having reviewed the evidence, Elizabeth Strive may have died at the hands of another, as everything about her murder is different than the others. Firstly, the time the murder took place, the knife that was used to cut her throat was much smaller than the other victims, hence the wound to her throat was smaller, and there were no other mutilations, says Marriott. The location was different than all the other murders, since she was on the right. The murder was right by the side of a workers' club, which was packed with men at the time. And now a serious question hangs over the death of Mary Kelly, too. Fresh material has come to the light, which may suggest that she was not Mary Kelly, but someone else, says Marriott. If that is the case, there is a motive, and there are likely suspects for her murder. Now, I mean, that's not very clear, but there, there are other theories out there that Mary Kelly was some type of active participant in the Jack the Ripper case, and that she faked her own death and had someone else murdered and the reason why the body was so heavily mutilated was they she wanted people to think that this was Mary Kelly. I don't um I can't really entertain that type of theory simply because as of now all it is is just some type of wild hypothesis that has been thrown out. As a forensic anthropologist, to review the ultimate cold case is a privilege. Initially I thought that Carl Feigenbaum was the serial killer. His profile fit this is on the author of the article talking. But further evidence outlined above may show that these murders were not at all committed by the same person. Feigenbaum could have been responsible for one or some or all. We have new lights shed on this old case, but it is certainly not solved, and the dark tale has many more secrets before we give up and say that we know the name of Jack the Ripper for sure. So, what do we think about Carl Feigenbaum as a Jack the Ripper suspect? What do we think about this idea that the Ripper didn't actually have anatomical knowledge and that the organs were removed in a different way? This is also very um, unclear as to how that would have taken place or that they were removed by somebody at the crime scene or something like that. I tend to lean more toward Patricia Cornwell and her claims on this that, that even if the suspect didn't have the knowledge of a medical doctor, he could have just been stabbing her and just reached his hand down and pulled on something. And also, um, in one of the um, sources that I'll talk about later, the Barlow and Watt documentary, they talk about how, with Catherine Eddowes, it wasn't the entirety of her uterus, it was a portion of the uterus that was cut out. So then, this isn't even pure um, organ removal. And as far as Feigenbaum, I noticed that there's an immediate desire to connect him to all those other homicides, 
not only the 1894 murder of Juliana Hoffman, but the murder in Wisconsin, the murder in Switzerland, and even Nicaragua. So someone has a traveling suspect, and they immediately turn him into a traveling serial killer, and they start attributing different crimes to them. This happens all the time. I mean, look at the Zodiac Killer mystery, for example. Now, believe it or not, I think that he matches some details and aspects of the case, and I found it particularly compelling about how he was a traveling merchant seaman. So, his ship's coming in and out of London, commits the murder, then he can leave for a while, commits a crime, and then he can go back to the docks. And it's almost as if he's sneaking out, and then he can not exactly have an alibi, but he's not someone that's going to be known to the locals. He's not going to be someone who would be easily identified, because people don't know who he is, and he's rarely in England at the time. And it's, um... I mean, those things make sense. And I really want to like this person, Trevor Marriott, because even from just reading these little bits of information about him, it seems as if he has a certain amount of um, intelligent curiosity about the case. And he's coming at it from a very smart angle. And he's doing the whole um, leave no stone unturned approach. And I do appreciate that. And Carl Feigenbaum is going to be a suspect that I'm going to keep investigating, but I am fully aware that sometimes people try to pattern seek to get a desired result. And for this next segment, I would like to discuss the 1953 film Man in the Attic. And yes, it's Man in the Attic. I wanted to call it The Man in the Attic the whole time, but when I was looking at the movie poster as well as the title of the film, it becomes apparent that it's Man in the Attic, and it was made in 1953. And it's based on the novel The Lodger, which went on to become the source material for multiple movies. I did a direct response to the movie The Lodger from 1927 by Alfred Hitchcock, which is credited as being the first movie about Jack the Ripper. And I thought that the 1953 film was going to be just the same story told over again. And I was like, well, you know, I guess I'll watch it. I mean, I'm kind of curious what, what, what I'll find. But it turns out that there were a lot of uh, twists and turns and surprises. I would highly recommend watching The Lodger first, and then you'll find out that, okay, well, there are all of these differences and unexpected events in Man in the Attic. But yes, it's based on the concept of somebody begins to rent a room to an individual, and they suspect that he might be Jack the Ripper. Now, The Lodger from 1927 had a fictionalized version of Jack the Ripper called The Avenger, but in this film from 53, they just flat out called him Jack the Ripper. It's also a somewhat fictionalized version of the events, and a dramatization all the same, but yes, he's definitely identified as Jack the Ripper, and they think that this man living in their house is Jack the Ripper. Now, the person who was playing the suspect was not of English descent. He almost had an American accent, but at some point he was trying to hide it or something. And they said that he grew up in Paris, France, but he definitely didn't have a regular French accent. I think that was just trying to add to the levels of mysterious nature. But one point that they did share in the film Man in the Attic was they had their own psychological profile of Jack the Ripper. Firstly, they believed that the killer was left-handed. Secondly, they believed the killer had medical knowledge. They believed that the killer was a bachelor. And they talked about how, I mean, a married man would not be able to commit these crimes against women. And I know that this is a film from 1953 that is trying to recreate England in 1888. But I think that this just fuels this whole narrative that the serial killer has to be the sad, lonely man. Countless times we have seen serial killers who are not sad, lonely men. They're married with children, and just the idea that the only person that could have done this is a single man without a wife and a family is rather beyond belief. And I don't even know how widely accepted that will be in the near future. Maybe to people who are outside of the true crime world, they're going to think that that only um, someone who doesn't have a type of romantic relationship is going to go on to become a serial killer. But, I mean, that was something that was shared in the film Man in the Attic all the same. 
Now, this whole thing about the Ripper being left-handed, I talked about it last week on the Jack the Ripper report, and I did a little bit of reading, and it appeared to have been either a myth or something that was not completely accepted. And in the film Man in the Attic, they say the exact same thing. They're like, no, wait a second. If he came up behind a woman and cut her throat in a particular direction, that would indicate that he was left-handed. But what if he had turned the blade around and come up to the victim and attacked her from the, hunk, from the front, but holding the blade in a different way? And that was just how the Ripper chose to hold his knife. And I could comprehend that a little bit more. And I think that, um, I mean, I'm not saying that that's actually how Jack the Ripper commit the murders, but they provide a very, very clear explanation as to how maybe the Ripper wasn't left-handed. And it's very important because you'd have to narrow down all of these suspects. And even in the film, Man in the Attic, you're like, okay, well, the Ripper was left-handed. Is your suspect left-handed? And they're like, no. But it also goes to show that there are types of... Um, types of animosity toward women that are expressed in the Ripper's crimes. And in the film Man in the Attic, the suspect tells this long story of how his mother um, walked out on them and she just became a lady of the streets. And that his father spent 10 years on the bottle just because of a broken heart. So he grew up in a somewhat of a broken home and he blamed his mother for it and that begins to fuel the suspicions as well now wait a second is this person jack the ripper and is this the motivation for the ripper crimes and also tying into the popular perception that the ripper was not a um not an englishman that he was a foreigner and i said the guy grew up in france even though he didn't have a french accent but it also shows us that there are, there's this widely held belief that Jack the Ripper was not English, and that is very relevant to many of the suspects out there, and it becomes a certain challenge for other people who are proposing an English suspect, whether it's Francis Thompson or Montague Druitt or James Maybrick, all of them, these um, suspects that I've talked about on the channel, and I don't necessarily think it's a strike against them because... I'm, I've just stated it once and I'll state it again. I don't think with absolute certainty that someone could simply get a glance of someone and determine whether they were English or not. More importantly, the people who think that the Ripper had to have been Jewish, getting a glance of someone and determining whether they had been, whether they were Jewish or not. But um, if you do watch the film Man in the Attic, I said it, it compared to The Lodger, it will have some things that will surprise you in a pretty good presentation for 1953. Now, one other source that had been um, recommended to me was the Barlow and Watts documentary series, and that was recommended by someone in the comments section, so if you have any ideas for future episodes of Black Box Online Radio, you can put your ideas down below. Anything that you would like incorporated into Ripper Wednesday, please uh, write it in the comments section, or you can email it to me at blackboxonlineradio at aol.com, and I will try my best to uh, respond to them. Now, this is a six-part documentary series that is done like a theatrical presentation, and there are two actors that are playing these characters, Barlow and Watt, and they're discussing the Ripper case. They also went, went through their own psychological profile of the Ripper murders, and they um, laid out a very interesting case about how, number one, the Ripper was left-handed, and in their own um, recreations of the crimes, they said the exact same thing in Man in the Attic. Maybe it's just a coincidence that they were covering the exact same point, but they showed how a right-handed person could turn the blade around, attack someone from the front side, and make it look like a left-handed person had done the crime. Again, no insinuation that the Ripper wanted to fool people that way. That was just his preference for holding the knife, but their ultimate conclusion was there is no evidence that Jack the Ripper was left-handed, or it's a premature claim if you're going to definitively state that the Ripper was left-handed. Now, they also talk about how there was an ending to the Ripper's crimes, to the best of our knowledge. I mean, some people believe the final Ripper crime occurred on November 9th of 1888 with the murder of Mary Kelly, and the two characters, Barlow and Water, are discussing this, and they say, now, was she the specific target 
was this man trying to go through different victims because he was looking for Mary Kelly and that when he was unsatisfied about finding her, he would murder them anyway, just not as extremely. And the response was, as an answer to that question, don't jump to conclusions. And I noticed that a lot of people in the true crime world are experiencing this type of jumping to conclusions effect. And I have to confess to you, when I'm hearing some of these stories about Carl Feigenbaum, that he is jumping to conclusions, Oh, by he, I mean people who think that he was Jack the Ripper as well as committing murders all over the world. Number one, it's possible. It's an unsolved case. But number two, these types of wild theories happen all the time. For example, there was one that the, the Axeman of New Orleans committed a 60-year crime spree murdering people in Germany as well, but also in the United States, and that it began in 1879 and it went on into Atlanta, Georgia in the 1920s, and there's, just, there's this one man going around the world committing axe murders, and somebody made a documentary about that. I mean, I don't think that there is sufficient evidence to support those things. We also see this in the Zodiac Killer mystery very frequently. Whether you have somebody like Ann Penn who is claiming that the Zodiac Killer murdered 200 people, or somebody like John Cameron who claims the Zodiac Killer murdered 660 people. I am not joking. He says that the Zodiac is suspect Edward Wayne Edwards committed 10 murders a year for 66 years. That means he murdered 660 people. And there's there is some pattern seeking there, but it's also jumping to conclusions, rushing to conclusions, if you want a different um, a different expression. And to the credit of the Barlow and Watt uh, documentary series, they are providing a dose of skepticism. And also they are showing that um, sometimes something might appear to be one way on the surface, like the Ripper had to have been a left-handed killer, or that he had to have been holding the knife in his left hand. But Sometimes there's a simple explanation that shows something to the contrary. And because this is the um, Jack the Ripper report, and I can cover different subjects, one thing that I would like to do is have a concluding note from a different um, Jack the Ripper suspect, and his name is Francis Thompson. Now, he's a suspect that I've spoken somewhat highly of in the past, but Francis Thompson is more famous for being a, a poet rather than being a Ripper suspect. And right now, I was thinking about incorporating this into the Ripper Wednesday episodes, and I would just like to end with a reading of Francis Thompson's most famous poem, The Hound of Heaven. And one of the key pieces of evidence that uh, Richard Patterson, who believes that Francis Thompson was Jack the Ripper, cites is the interpretations of his poetry. This is uh, The Hound of Heaven, by Francis Thompson. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind and in the midst of tears. I hid from him and under running laughter up the state hopes I sped and shot precipitated adown titanic glooms of chasm fears from those strong feet that followed followed after, but with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat, and a voice beat, more instant than the two feet. All things betray thee who betrayest me. I pleaded outlaw-wise by many a hearted casement, curtained red, trestled with, with intertwining charities. For though I knew his love who followed, yet was I sore adread, lest having him I must have not aside. But if no one little casement parted wide, the gust of his approach would clash it too. Fear wist not to evade, as love wist to pursue. Across the margin of the world I fled, and troubled the gold gateways of the stars, smiting for shelter on their clanged bars, fretted to the dulcet jars and the silvern chatter in the pale ports o' the moon. I said to dawn, be sudden, to eve, be soon, with thy young ski bosoms heap over me, from this tremendous lover, float thy vague veil about me, lest he see, I tempted all his servitors, but to find my own betrayal in their constancy, in faith to him their fickleness 
to me, their traitorous trueness and their loyal deceit. To all swift things for swiftness did I sue, clung to the whistling mane of every wind, but whether they swept smoothly fleet the long savannas of the blue, or whether thunder-driven they clanged his chariot thwart a heaven, plashy with flying lightnings round, the spurn, o oh, their feet, fear wist not to evade love, wist to pursue. Still in hurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, came on the following feet, and a voice above their beat, not shelters thee who wilt not shelter me. I sought no more that after which I stayed, in face of man or maid, but still within the little child's eyes, seems something, something that replies, they are at least for me, surely for me. I turned to them very wistfully, but just as their young eyes grew sudden fair, with dawning answers there, their angels plucked them from me by the hair. Come then, ye other children, nature's share with me, your delicate fellowship. Let me greet you lip to lip, let me twine your caresses, wantoning with our lady mother's vagrant tresses, banqueting with her in the wind, while palace underneath her azure diutes, quaffing at your taintless ways from a chalice, loose and weeping of the dayspring, so it was done. I and their delicate fellowship was one. Drew the bolt of nature's secrecies, I knew all of the swift importings on the willful face of skies. I knew how the clouds arise, swim to the wild sea and snorting, all that's born or dies. Rose and drooped, with made them shapers, of mine own moods, unwillful divine. With them joyed and bereaven, I was heavy with the even, when she lit her glimmering tapers round the day's dead sanctities. I laughed in the morning's eyes, I triumphed and I saddened with all the weather, heaven and I wept together, and its sweet tears were salt with mortal mine against the red throb of its sunset heart. I laid my own to beat and share a commingling heat, and not by that was eased by human smart, and my vain tears were wet on heaven's gray cheek, for ah, we know what each other say, these things and I and sound and speak, their sound is but the stir, they speak silences, nature poor stepdad of me, cannot shake my drouth, let her, if she would owe me, Drop yon blue bosom, veil of sky, and show me. The breasts of her tenderness never did any milk of hers once bless my thirsting mouth. Nigh and nigh draws the chase with an unperturbed pace, deliberate speed and majestic instancy and fast-paced noise feet of voices come yet more fleet. Lo, not contents thee, who contented not me. Naked I wait thy love's uplifted stroke my harness piece by piece thou hast hewn me and smitten me to my knee i am defenceless utterly i spent me thanks and woke i slept me thanks and woke i slowly gazing find me stripped in sleep and in the rash and lusty headed of my young powers i shut the pillaring hours and pulled my life upon me grimed with smears i stand amid the dust of mounted years and mangled youth lies dead beneath the heap. My days have crackled and gone up in smoke, have puffed and burst as sun starts on a stream. Ye faileth now even dream, the dreamer and the lute, the lute had missed, even the linked fantasies in whose blossomy twist. I swung the earth at a trinket at my wrist, our yielding cores of all too weak account, for earth with heavy grief so overplussed. Ah! Is thy life love indeed a weed, albeit an amaranth weed, suffering no flowers except its own to mount? I must, act thou knowest not, how little worthy of thou art, for whom wilt thou find to love and noble thee? Save me, save only me, all of which I took from thee I did, but I did take, not for thy harms, but just thou might seek it, in my arms, all which thy child's mistake fancies as lost I have stored for thee at home. 
Rise, clasp my hand, and come. Halt by me that footfall is my gloom after all. Shade of his hand outstretched caressingly. How fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he who thou seekest. Thou dravest love from me, who dravest me. All right, now, after reading that, I think there's a very high chance that this person had somewhat of a murderous mind. This poem is the most famous one from Francis Thompson, The Hound of Heaven, and he's the subject of the book. Jack the Ripper, The Works of Francis Thompson by Richard Patterson. Oh, definitely seems like he has a dark and twisted mind, maybe even a murderous mind. But as far as anything Ripper-related, I don't see any exact clues in this one. But this will be something that I'm going to be exploring in future Ripper reports, looking at the poems of Francis Thompson as a form of conclusion. What do you think about Carl Feichenbaum as the Jack the Ripper suspect? What do you think about the Ripper being left-handed? And what do you think about any interpretation of Francis Thompson's poetry. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxnid88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there. Until next time.